Okay, I'm truly honored to introduce our next guest. She has been dedicated and innovative public service who is passionate about growing an economy that works for everyone. First as governor of Rhode Island and now as United States Secretary of Commerce, she has made it her main mission to create jobs for working class Americans and to ensure that those who care for us are cared for back. Please help me welcome the United States Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. Good morning. And joining her is our chair, John Hope Bryant. <laughs> My friend, how are you? I am so happy to be with you. How are you doing? I'm terrific. You, you, um, you remind me of our last in-person meeting before the pandemic when you were governor of Rhode Island. Just the office is bigger. Flags are more robust. Your territory has expanded. I the hope same. you still have your Hope license plate. I still have. <laughs> so she issued me a Rhode Island Hope license plate, <laughs> which I have never tried using on the road, but it is framed in my office. But you have the same warm spirit, the same humanity that you had when we were governor. The, the thing I like about my friends is how normal they are. The power hasn't, I mean, T Stephanie Rule, who was just on before us, I didn't even know she was coming on right after me because I quoted her in the last session. She's talking about something that you're passionate about, expanding the table and adding a seat, expanding a table and adding a chair. And that's what you did when you were governor in Rhode Island, where we partnered together on the jobs initiative during the pandemic, creating, getting the price sector to come to, to the table to create jobs and opportunities for those small business, well, business opportunities for the small businesses and then job opportunities for residents who were unfortunately left out and left behind um, and isolated because of the pandemic. But you refused to take no for an answer. And uh, you've taken that same vision and you applied it at the federal level in your new role, uh, which I'm so proud of as Secretary of Commerce. Ambassador Andrew Young, who's my co-host and was here just last night, will be here in a few hours, he says coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. I think it's no coincidence that you're in this role at this point, at this time, doing this job. Um, I want to talk about, I keep saying, Ms. Secretary, that we're living in a moment in history. But history does not feel historic when you're sitting and it just feels like another day. I want to talk about whether you believe this is just a blip on the screen and something, a problem and an opportunity, I'm sorry, a problem, the pandemic and an opportunity, meaning more GDP growth and stability to get through, or whether you believe like me that this is a reset. And, and a, a, I think a 50 to 100 year opportunity to, 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 to set things right, I call it the third reconstruction, you and I have talked about this, um, for all people. Uh, but we have about five or 10 years to get it right uh, at scale. And if you believe that, what do you think are some of the fundamental pieces in place to make that happen? And maybe if you believe that, which I think you do, that explains why you're putting so much energy into doing things and implementing things that are bigger than the problems that we face right now. Ms. Secretary. Yeah, yeah, so um, again, it's great to be with you. And I uh, so truly admire you, as I do with many of my friends. And I love the work you're doing you. and, and want you to continue and continue with the passion and strength and vigor um, that you always have. The question of whether this is a transformation is, honestly, I think it's up to us. It could go both ways. Yep. It could go both ways. And shame on us if we don't turn it into a transformation. Mm. So we have a moment in front of us now that I think we have to answer the moment. You know, it's on us. Are we going to make big, bold investments in housing and mental health and childcare 
so that we can, as you say, have this transformational moment so that 10 years from now we look back and say that was the moment when as a country we got serious about equity, le leveling the playing field, making a seat at the table for women, kids who are struggling uh, with poverty or learning differences or mental illness, uh, people who've been left out or marginalized. You know, that's, the, that's what the moment requires. Yeah. And if we step up and make those fundamental changes to our institutions, to our social norms, to our laws, to the way we spend money, then this will have been the transformation, transformational moment that it ought to be. If we get weak in the knees mm. and just try to, you know, make a little bit of investments yeah. here and there, nibble around the edges of equity, avoid the really uncomfortable truths and discussions, then, then we'll miss it. And I don't know when we'll have this chance again. Yes. And yes, that last part, I'm not sure we're gonna have this chance again because rainbows only follow storms. You're gonna have a rainbow without a storm first. And certainly we've been through the storm and now we're trying to frame out that rainbow and do it in a way that includes all of God's children. It, it's really important that you, as a result of this, have a common touch. You, you, you can operate at the 30,000 foot level, but you also understand what's happening at the 30 foot level. How's your background growing up? I, I know your story, but the public, I don't think may not as much, they just see a member of the president's cabinet for the largest economy on the planet, the sole superpower in the world, and they assume maybe that everything's always been rosy and great for you. Can you tell the audience a little bit about how your background growing up has informed how you lead in this moment? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You say 30,000 foot, 30 feet. For me, the only thing that matters is the 30 feet. Mm. Like what's going on in America at this moment for the everyday family. Yep. So, you know, I will say I have been so lucky uh, in my life, but it hasn't always been easy. Definitely not always been easy. We struggled as a kid when my dad lost his job. There were um, skinny Christmases and anxiety over finances. Uh, certainly I was never poor, but, you know, always worked however many jobs was necessary to get through college, came out of law school, massively indebted, um, have had my share of ups and downs. And that, that, um, that motivates me. I've also seen my family struggle. Yep. You know, I've seen uh, my dad, you know, when you take a, a man who was proud of his work and put him out of work unceremoniously in his late 50s. He never really recovered, um, not just financially, but emotionally. Self pride. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by the way, it was tough on my mom, yeah. tough on her family. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you see these things um, and it, it really motivates me. In my case, I would say um, it, education was, was really the ticket. You know, sometimes I look. I'll look outside and I'll see a handful of kids crammed into an old car in the back seat. Um, mom and dad clearly tired, or maybe just mom or dad clearly tired in the front seat. Yeah. And I look at that, I'm like, that was me. Yep. You no, know, my grandfather lived with us in the house. My brother, my sister, me squished into a small house. I was that kid in the back seat, and here I am. You know, in the cabinet, Ivy League education, my own children flourishing. Well, you know, my dad went to college on the GI Bill. I got through because of a, the grace of God, a lot of good luck, public education, public buses, public libraries. You know, um, you're a fool if you think you did it on your own. That's right. You're a fool, and I'm not that foolish yep. to think I did it on my own. Yep. I, I have enough humility to know I didn't, and that's what motivates me every day. Be there for people. You know, I'm in the fight now with the president to bring about um, public pre-K. Yep. Every four-year-old, five-year-old deserves a chance to get a good start in life. That's right, that's right. They're applauding for you on that, yep.
the, you talk about the care economy often. Uh, I'm going to connect this, Madam Secretary, with the plight of women and how during this pandemic, three plus million women did not get back to work because I think they're concerned about their children and what's going to happen with them when they go back to work. What, where, what's the state of daycare and home care and the state of schools and health? Uh, and society may not fully appreciate the burdens on them, women in society. You have, of course, a unique perspective in that regard. Um, but you walk in rooms, and I've never seen you play games, even when people are game playing games with you. Um, what is your take uh, on, you, what is your sense of what you can do in your role to bring other folks up the ladder with you in your role as Secretary of Commerce to include all of God's children in this plan for opportunity? And does that in any way dovetail with this thing I call the third reconstruction? I've said the first reconstruction was, uh, was after slavery, and that was basic freedom. Second reconstruction was during the civil rights movement. We're in the same ballroom where Dr. King met with Andrew Young, Ambassador Andrew Young and others, uh, to, to pivot toward poverty. The second reconstruction was about getting a job and getting access. It's the third re and, and freedom. The third reconstruction is about economics through a, or social justice through an economic lens. So financial literacy for all, wealth creation for those at the bottom of the pyramid, specifically the One Million Black Business Initiative that you and I have been talking about, um, uh, financial coaching for all, getting people a laddering system so that pe people have the credit score and the access, the opportunity to compete at a level playing field, and corporate inclusion. What's your, any, take that any way you want to go. Yeah, so two, so two things. I think we have to be real about the fact that the past year and a half has been brutal on women, yeah. brutal. It has been a struggle to get through the day every day for so many women and moms in America. Lack of childcare, schools closed, put out of work because of COVID, can't pay the healthcare bills. So if we are serious about equity, and oh, by the way, if we're serious about giving women a chance to get back into the workforce, we better make investments in public pre-K. Pre-K should be free, period. A kid goes to school at five, ought to be able to go to school at four. Mm. Better make investments in child care. Yeah. It's insane that we have to choose between going to work or, you know, taking care of our kids. It's insane that most people spend more on childcare than a mortgage or their rent. So I think it, we have to get beyond the happy talk and make necessary investments to enable women to live their lives, take care of their kids, and you know be productive in the workforce. On the other issue, you said, I know equity is a buzzword at the moment, but. Let's go, let's just think about the lived experience of so many black and brown people in America. You know, maybe born into poverty, yep. maybe don't have a house, no housing security, maybe, uh, you know, don't get a chance to go to school until they're five, go to a dilapidated public school where uh, they don't get a great education. Yep. Starting in high school, their cops walk in the halls of the high school. They pass through metal detectors to get in the school. Maybe they get arrested in the school um, for some minor violation. They're headed, they have that on their record. Yep. Um, can we honestly say that we care about equity and we're you know, giving these kids a fair shot so the world that I think the president um, envisions, and certainly that I support, is getting kids off to a decent start with housing that is secure and safe and free of lead and clean water with no lead in the water, going to a vibrant, flourishing public school where there is equity and where and where and where. These kids have a chance where if you have a learning difference or not, or you show up on day one behind or not, there's, you know, a customized education experience for you. Yep. And you come out of high school 
with a job if you need it or a path to college if you need it. Yep. That's, that's the real stuff of equity uh, that I think we just have to make a reality. And we can, of course we can. Uh, we just have to be committed to doing it. So I, I know we aren't ready to talk about it now, but I want to did I do want the audience to know that I am working with my team is working with the secretary's team in commerce around these initiatives that she just mentioned, most notably creating wealth through business, whether it's black business, Latino business, Asian business, women owned business, that this is her mandate. And hopefully we have something that we will be able to share with the public soon. And I'm honored to also have been selected as an advocate of the year for MBDA, which is part of the Department of Commerce about a month ago. Thank you. So as we pivot here, Madam Secretary, uh, and look toward the future, a lot of what you've talked about, I see embedded in the new infrastructure bill. Uh, we're talking about roads and, and bridges, which is essential. We're 13th in infrastructure in the world. That is unacceptable for the largest economy in the world. I've said, you didn't say it, I'm saying it, but we are at war, an economic war with, with, with interests in the world who want to be us. Not a war of bombs and bullets, but an economic war where they want to replace us as a leader in the world. They want our freedom, they want our way of life. I've often said everybody wants to be an American but Americans because <laughs> we're arguing with each other. Uh, but, but this is serious and this infrastructure bill is critical to our competitiveness for the future. But there's a human capital part of that which really you just talked about. Uh, that the soft skills and the retraining to prepare us for the economy of the future, which is economic in nature. These things you just mentioned have an economic, correct me if I'm wrong, an economic knock-on effect. Is that right? Absolutely. No, so let me say, you mentioned the infrastructure package. I'm so happy you brought it up. Let's talk about what it is. You know, in this infrastructure package, it's the largest federal investment in public transit in history. How do people get to work and school, public transit, buses, subways, et cetera? This is the biggest in history. It's the largest investment in repairing and reconstructing our nation's bridges since uh, the start of the interstate highway system. Wow. You know, I used to joke in Rhode Island that you have to, you have to say your prayers when you go over the bridge because some of them are so old and creaky, it shouldn't be that way. Um, it's enough money to make sure that every single American has access to high speed, affordable, reliable broadband. We've got to close the digital divide. Absolutely, close that digital divide. Um, so, you know, it's enough money to get rid of all the lead pipes in America so every kid can have clean water, regardless of where they live. Um, and by the way, in the process of doing all that, laying fiber for broadband, fixing roads, bridges, and schools. You know what we're going to do? Create a massive number of jobs. That's right. And, and let's make sure that those jobs go to women and men, you know, people of color, yeah. who have too often been shut out of some of these big infrastructure projects and yeah. union membership. Yeah. So I think this is just such a massive opportunity. And, and I love, one of the things I've always loved about you is, you don't shy away from the fact that, yes, this is about economics. Like, this is about making sure that people who've been left out can make some money, That's can right. build some wealth, can take care of their families. There's nothing wrong about that. And so it's, it's having skills, it's getting a job, it's having financial literacy tools, it's having a chance in the workplace. And that's kind of all we're talking about here. All these investments enable that productivity. Well, as you, as, the, as we're wrapping up now, I know you got a, a country to help lead, um, and I thank you for being with us today. This is really, as you and President Biden have said, this is building back better. This is about a vision for all of us. This is not a partisan issue. This is a time where all of us should be coming together, white and black, red and blue, to produce some more green, <laughs> some more economics, and some more sustainability for all of us. Uh, uh, I have friends, Secretary, who say, Oh, I hate rich people. No, you don't. You hate rich people till you become rich. <laughs> what you hate is a game system. What you hate is a system that doesn't include you. And, and for those who don't understand where her government, her money comes from, it comes from you and me, taxpayers. We need more people paying taxes, contributing to the system. These things she's talking about creates GDP, gross domestic product, because better roads and 
infrastructure and better, and better educated people create more income. It is a, uh, a mission and a vision that we're all in this thing together. Madam Secretary, thanks for all you do. Remember that no good deeds shall go unpunished, but do good anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Keep fighting. This will be a transformative moment if we make it so. So let's stay at it and make it that way. Can we please say thank you to the Secretary of Commerce? Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, Thank my you friend. for having me. Honored. God bless you.